nature is reduced to the level of an animal, right? Yes, this is how King Lear sees himself. Okay. Uh, why when you see uh, Edgar in the Heath, he sees him as a real man and he wants to take off all the borrowings of the civilization? Okay, this is King Lear. When King Lear sees Edgar as a naked man, he says that this is <coughs> the real thing. I mean, this is the man that is stripped of the borrowings of civilization. So King Lear is saying that without the borrowings of civilization, man ends up in the state of nature. Okay. But he doesn't want to be like that. He doesn't? He doesn't want to be like that. Of course. Okay. Inglier doesn't want to live in the state of nature, but in his madness, he wants to take off his clothes, i.e. the borrowings of civilization and culture. Okay, doctor. Thank you. Not at all. Okay, so last time I left the discussion at Act 4, Scene 6. Act 4, Scene 6. Line 95. Gloucester, I know that voice. Okay, Lear, I will go back to what I read at the end of the last session. Ha, huh? Goneril with a white beard, they flattered me like a dog and told me I had white hairs in my beard ere the black ones were there. <coughs> okay. So they flattered me. So here King Lear realizes that the world of kingship is a world of flattery and hypocrisy. I.e. people flatter the king in order to get what they want from the king. Okay, so they want to benefit themselves by flattering the king. So that's why King Lear sees the world of kingship as a world of hypocrisy and lies and told me I had white hairs in my beard ere the black ones were there. So they used to tell him that he was a wise person. So when he was a king, the people associated him with I am no, i.e. to say yes and to everything that I said. So people say yes and no to everything that the king says. So they try to please him. So according to King Lear, saying yes and no is no good divinity. This is biblical. Okay? So a person who says yes and no do the same thing is a liar. Okay? So you one should either say yes or no, not yes and no to the same thing. So that's why he says it is no good divinity, and this is a reference to the Bible. When the rain came to wet me once, and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder wouldn't peace at my bidding, there I found them, there I smelled them out. Okay, so when he is stripped of power, people desert him. So that's why he says, well, the thunder wouldn't peace at my bidding. So when he asks the wind to stop, the, the thunder to stop, it doesn't stop. So it means that he is no longer a man of authority. So when he is, or when he has lost 
his authority and power, King Lear is no longer obeyed as a man. Okay, so authority is a source of power and order according to King Lear. There I found them, there I smelled them out. Go to, they are not men of their words. They told me I was everything. This a lie, I'm not a proof. Okay, then Gloucester says the trick of that voice I do well remember. Is it not the king? Lear, I every inch. A king. When I do stare, see how the subject waits. I pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery? Thou shalt not die. Die for adultery? No, the ram goes to it, and the small gilded fly does lecture in my sight. Let population thrive, for Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughters got between the lawful sheets. To it, luxury, pell for I lack soldiers. Behold yon simpering dame, whose face between her frocks presages snow that minces virtue and thus shake the head to hear of pleasure's name. Okay, so here King Lear is saying that all people are sinners. That's why he says, I pardon that man's life. What was the cause? Adultery, thou shalt not die. Die for adultery, no, the ram goes to it. And the small gilded fly does lecture in my sight. So this is a reference also to the Bible. Okay, Jesus Christ forgave the prostitute whom the Jews of her society were trying to punish, okay? So the Jews, according to the Bible, were stoning the prostitute, i.e. Mary Magdalene. Magdalene, M-A-G-D-A-L-E-I-N-E. -E. So Mary Magdalene is a prostitute. And the Jews, of her society want to stone her. So this is the punishment of the prostitute according to the Old Testament. Jesus Christ prevented them from stoning the woman. So this means that he forgave the prostitute. Okay? So here according to Jesus Christ, all people are sinners. So that's why he says to the Jews, he who has never sinned may stone her. He who has never sinned may stone her. Stone, S-T-O-N-E. Okay? So this is how the prostitute is punished according to the Old Testament, by stoning him or her. Okay? So when Jesus Christ says that, it means that Jesus Christ has forgiven the prostitute. So we forgive, we don't punish according to the New Testament. And here King Lear is saying that all people are sinners. That's why he doesn't want to punish the adulterer. Okay? Then he says, Behold, young simpering dame, whose face between her frocks 
simply say it is snow that means is virtue and thus shake the head to hear of pleasures name the fit shoe nor the soiled horse goes to it with a more riotous appetite okay here king lear is referring to the issue of reality and appearance is referring to the issue of reality and appearance okay so according to the renaissance man is a well integrated entity made of a body and a soul according to the philosophy of the renaissance man is a well integrated entity made up of a body and a soul according to this philosophy the body should be a reflection of the soul the body should be a reflection of the soul okay so that's why we say the man is a well integrated entity so this is the optimistic view of man so man's outer appearance reflects his reality i.e his inner self man's physical appearance reflects his in ourself okay here king lear is saying that the people of his society put on masks that hide their inner selves the people of his society put on masks to hide their inner selves okay so in other words the physical appearances of his subjects do not reflect their real inner selves so here the lady is an example of these hypocritical people the lady that is mentioned in this passage is symbolic of the hypocritical people of lear's kingdom she pretends to be chaste chaste c h a s t i e pure not interested in sexual intercourse okay so she seems to be chaste but deep down she is a prostitute according to king lear okay so she seems to be a chaste woman but deep down she is a prostitute so that's why he says behold your young simpering dame whose face between her frocks presages snow so snow is a symbol of purity of chastity so she pretends to be chaste she pretends to be virtuous that means is virtue and does shake the head to hear of pleasure's name i.e she is shocked when she is or when she hears of sexual pleasure this is the meaning of pleasure's name sexual pleasure the fit to nor the soiled horse i e these are two animals goes to it with a more riotous appetite i e deep down she aspires to she hankers to have sexual pleasure okay So here King Lear comes to the realization that the people of his kingdom put on masks to have to hide their real selves. Okay? So their appearances do not reflect their reality. Is it clear? Okay. 
<coughs> down from the waist. They are centaurs, the women all above. Now, according to Greek myth, the centaur is a creature that is half horse, half man. Okay? The centaur is a creature that is half horse, half man. So the lower part of this creature is a horse part, and the upper part is a human part. Okay? So the animal part that is suggested here is symbolic of the animalistic nature of man, i.e. of his instincts. The animal part of the centaur that is mentioned in this passage is symbolic of the animalistic aspect of human nature. In other words, it refers to man's instincts. Okay? So here he's saying that these women have the appearance of women, but deep down they are animals controlled by their instincts. Okay? These women have the appearance of women, but deep down they are animals controlled by their instincts. But to the girdle do the gods inherit, beneath is all the fiends, so they look like gods. But beneath this mask, they are fiends, they are devils, and the devil is associated with sin, as you know. Okay? So their physical appearance gives the impression that they are gods, i.e. they are virtuous, but deep down they are devils, i.e. they are sinners. Is it clear? Yes, Doctor, it's clear. Okay, so this is another kind of knowledge of singular acquires. Okay? Then Gloucester says, Oh, let me kiss that hand. Lear, let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Gloucester aside, Oh, ruined piece of nature. This great world shall so wear out to naught. So, oh, ruined piece of nature, this is King Lear. So, King Lear now is a ruined man. He is a ruined microcosm. That's why Gloucester says this great world shall so wear out to naught. So the destiny of the universe is associated with the health of the king. This is also mythical. It is related to the myth of fertility rights. Now King Lear is utterly, totally, mad and because he is mad the whole world is in a state of disorder so 
sorry, doctor. Yes. Can I know where are you reading? I'm still reading at 4C6. Okay, thank you. This is where I stopped last night. Okay. Okay, I will skip some lines. Line 145. <coughs> At 4, scene 6, line 145. Okay, so Lear asks Gloucester the following question. Yet, you see how this world goes? Okay, to help you find it. Gloucester says, I see it feelingly. Lear, what? Art mad? A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how young justice rails upon young simple thief. Young means that, or there. Hark in thine ear. Hark, i.e. listen with your own ear. Change places and handy dandy. Which is the justice? Which is the thief? How hast thou hast seen a farmer's dog Bark at a beggar. I.e., have you ever seen a farmer's dog barking at a beggar? I want to comment on this. Gloucester says, I, sir, leer, and the creature run from the care. I.e., the beggar run from the dog. And the creature run from the care. There thou mightest behold the great image of authority. The dogs obeyed in office. Again, he is referring to the idea of authority and the idea of obedience. So here he is saying that a man who is strict of authority is no longer obeyed by others. So that's why he says, a dog is obeyed in office. So even if the dog has an office, i.e. even if the dog is in a position of power, he will be obeyed. So now King Lear sees himself as a man who has lost power and control over his subjects. He is no longer obeyed. Thou rascal beadle. A beadle is a religious figure. A beadle is a religious figure. He is a kind of a priest. Okay? Thou rascal beadle. Hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? This is a reference to the story of Mary Magdalene. This is a reference to the story of Mary Magdalene, which I have already mentioned. Strip thine own back. Thou hotly lusts to use her in that kind for which thou whippest her. The usurer hangs the cousiner. Okay, so this is it. So the beadle wants to to lash, to whip the whore. King Lear imagines that he is trying a group of sinners. Trying T R Y I N G. So he imagines that he is at a court. He has summoned a group of sinners 
and he wants to try them. So here he is saying that the people who wants to whip the horn wants in fact to commit adultery with her. He wants in fact to commit adultery with her. Okay, so this is also a reference to the Bible. He who has never sinned may stone her so all people are sinners. So they don't have the right to punish each other. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Here King Lear draws a contrast between the rich and the poor. Here King Lear draws a contrast between the rich and the poor. So through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. So this is a reference to poor people. So according to King Lear, the sins of the poor are known to all people, whereas the sins of the rich are hidden. So this is the difference. So according to King Lear, the poor are punished for their sins, whereas the rich evade justice, E-V-A-D. The poor are punished for their sins, whereas the rich evade justice. So this is another example of social injustice that holds sway of King Lear's universe. Okay, so there is social inequality, social injustice, i.e. discrimination. Okay, so here King Lear is saying that the rich man hides his sins behind his gorgeous clothes, behind his pompous. P-O-M-P-O-U-S, pompous clothes. Okay. Great sin with gold and the strong glance of justice, hurtless breaks. Yes, the rich people evade justice. Armed in rags, i.e., it's a plate sin with gold. So here we have a reference to the and the rich and the strong lands of justice, hurtless, breaks. So this means that the rich are not punished for their sins. Their sins are not known to other people. Armed in rags, i.e. clothes sin with tattered, i.e. with worn out clothes, a pig means straw does pierce it. So this means that the sins of the poor are known to others. So this is an example of social injustice. Okay? So here King Lear is saying that the rich and the powerful have the upper hand in their society. The rich and the powerful have the upper hand in their society, i.e. they are in control of their society. Okay, none does offend. None, I say none, 
I'll be I'll able them. Take that of me, friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. Okay, so here Edgar comments on King Lear's statement. He says, you may skip some lines. Edgar aside, oh matter and impertinence mixed, i.e. sense and nonsense mixed. Reason in madness. Okay? Reason in madness. So King Lear is a madman, but his statements are wise statements. So in his madness, King Lear <coughs> has acquired knowledge of the true nature of man. Okay? So all people are sinners. All people are evil deep down. So if they are <coughs> given the chance to implement the laws of the state of nature, if they are given the chance to introduce the law of the state of nature into their society, they will behave as the primitive creatures of the wilderness, i.e. of the state of nature. They will behave as the primitive creatures of the state of nature. Goneril, Regan, Cornell, and Edmund introduced the law of the jungle into the kingdom and reduce it to a state of nature. Okay, so deep down, man is evil. So man's first nature, according to philosophy as well as according to King Lear, is evil. But the borrowings of civilization, but the borrowings of civilization suppress, control this evil nature. Okay? And here I can refer to Freud, Sigmund Freud, S-I-G-M-U-N-D Freud, F-R-E-U-D Okay? Sigmund Freud wrote a book entitled Civilization and its discontents Civilization and its discontents. Discontents, D-I-S-C-O-N-T-E-N-T-S. -E and you have to underline the title. This is the title of the book written by Freud. Okay? In this book, Freud maintains that living in a civilized universe requires that man suppress control or should suppress control his drives and tendencies. Okay? So according to Freud, In a civilized universe, man cannot satisfy all of his drives, especially the drives that are associated with violence and evil. Okay? So to be a civilized man, one has 
to suppress or to control or to sublimate these tendencies. I will give you an example. For example, if man has a tendency to be violent, he cannot go around hitting this person and that person. Instead, according to Freud, he should sublimate this tendency, sublimate. S-U-B-L-I-M-A-T-E. I.e. he should channel, direct this tendency towards something acceptable. He should channel or direct this tendency towards something acceptable, socially acceptable. So instead of going around hitting this and that, the man who has a tendency towards violence may, let's say, practice a certain kind of sport that requires violence and strength. Okay? So in this case, he sublimates his tendency. Okay? So he may be a wrestler. Okay? So he may join a club of wrestling or a wrestling club. So in this case, he sublimates the tendency to be violent by practicing the sport of wrestling. So this is how we become civilized, according to Freud. And here, King Lear is referring to this fact, okay? So to be a civilized man, one should control his basic tendencies and drives. One should achieve his goals in an honorable manner. Okay? So General Regan, Edmund, and Cornell try to fulfill their ambition through evil means. Okay? So that's why I said earlier on King Lear's madness gives him insight into the true nature of man the true nature of kingship. Okay? And that's why Edgar comments on King Lear's statement saying reason in madness. And he says matter and impertinence mixed, i.e. sense and nonsense mixed. Okay, so here Edgar plays the role of the implied reader. Implied reader, I M P L I E D. Okay, the implied reader means that a character in a work of literature comments on a certain action. Okay, so this is the duty of the reader. 
to comment on the action, not the characters. It is the duty of the reader to comment on the action. Okay, it is not the duty of the characters. So when a certain character comments on a certain action, we call that character implied reader. So here, Edgar is the implied reader because he takes the role of the readers. Okay, so it is our duty to come to the conclusion that although King Lear is mad, yet his statements are wise. Is it clear? Yes, Doctor. Yes, Doctor, please. The idea of Freud and the idea of the implied reader. Yes, clear. Okay. So in his madness, King Lear acquires knowledge of the true nature of man, the true nature of kingship, and the true nature of the social order and the state of nature, i.e. the differences between the social order and the state of nature. Clear. If the wilt weep my fortunes, take my eyes, I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. We come crying hither. I.e. we come crying to this universe. I.e. when we are born, we cry. And I will comment on the significance of this. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air. We wail and cry. I will preach to thee. Mark. Gloucester, alack, alack the day. I alas. Lear, when we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. Okay, so this is a light motif that we have in Shakespeare's tragedies and in his plays in general. Shakespeare here compares the world to a stage. So that's why he says, when we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. So according to King Lear, the world is a stage. And when we are born, we are born to a stage. In other words, and this becomes clearer, in Macbeth. Okay, so in Macbeth, Macbeth says, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player, i.e. a poor actor, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. So each one of us has a certain role to play. So that's why he says, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player. 
i.e. a poor actor. So each one of us has a role which he has to fulfill and the world is a stage. So our life looks like acting on a stage. So when your role is over, you disappear. Okay? So this is it. So King Lear mentions this idea in this act. It is mentioned by Macbeth at the end of Macbeth. It is mentioned by uh, Antonio in The Merchant of Venice. And it is mentioned also in Much Ado About It. Okay, so it is mentioned in many of Shakespeare's plays. That's why we call it a light motif, i.e. a recurring theme. Okay, so this idea is light motif, L-E-I-T-M-O-T-I-F. It means a recurring theme. Okay, so then there will be a war between the English army and the French army. And we know that Edgar is now taking care of his father while they are on the heath. Oswald, Goneril's servant, attacks. Goneril uh, attacks Gloucester, he wants to kill him, but Edgar defends his father and kills Oswald. Oswald gives him a letter. The letter is sent from Goneril to Edmund, and she tells him that he should kill her husband so that he will marry her. Okay? So the crimes of Goneril and Regan and Edmund are made clear to the good characters of the play. Okay, Act 4, Scene 7. Okay, Act 4, Scene 7, it is line 15. Okay, so this is the French can, Cordelia. meets Kent and the doctor that is taking care of her father. Okay? So she says to the doctor, Oh, you... Okay, she asked the doctor about her father. She says, How does the king Doctor, madam, sleeps still. Cordelia, oh, you kind gods, cure this great breach in his abused nature. 
the untuned and jarring senses or wind up of this child changed father. Okay, so here Cordelia compares her father to a stringed musical instrument. She compares her father to a stringed musical instrument that needs to be tuned. Stringed, S-T-R-I-N-G-E-D. Okay? Now she compares her father's, like, say, insanity, his madness, to a musical instrument that is out of tune. So she asks the doctor to tune, to wind up. Okay? To tune this musical instrument, i.e. to heal her father, of this child changed father. So the father is changed to a child. And this is also a reference to the fact that Goneril and Regan have violated the natural order. They have reversed the natural order. So they have re reduced their father to the level of a child. So they have become the mothers and Lear has become the child. Okay, so music is a symbol of harmony. Music is a symbol of harmony. So that's why Goneril compares her father to a musical instrument that needs to be tuned, i.e. he lacks harmony. He is totally mad and his madness is compared to a musical instrument that needs to be tuned. I will skip some lines. By the way, I have only 26 or 25 students attending. What about the others? At the beginning, I used to have 95, 85, 75, 65, 50. The number is shrinking now. Why? I don't know, doctor. Anyway, you'd better attend. And they know that if they don't attend, they wouldn't be able to do well on the exam. Okay, then I will skip some lines. Line 30. Or let's say 25. Okay, King Lear enters. He is carried in a chair by servants. Cordelia, let's say, line 27 in my edition. Oh, my dear father. Line 27 in my edition. Oh, my dear father. Restoration hang thy medicine on my lips. And let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. Kent, kind and dear princess. 
Okay? So here Cordelia is comparing herself to the medicine that would heal her father. She compares herself to the medicine that would heal her father. Okay? So this highlights the good side of Cordelia's character. Okay? And that's why at the beginning of the semester I said Cordelia represents the Christian and moral values that King Lear aspires to have in his kingdom. Okay? And that's why he has expected to spend the rest of his life with Cordelia. So Cordelia here says, restoration, i.e. the restoration of your health, the restoration of your sanity, hangs thy medicine on my lips, and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. So Cordelia is a source of life for King Lear. Okay? So that's why King Lear dies at the end of the play when Cordelia dies. Cordelia, had you not been their father, these white flakes had challenged pity of them. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds, to stand against the deep, dread bolted thunder? In the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross lightning, to watch poor Perdue with this thin helm, mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. And wast thou fain, poor father, to hobble thee with swine and rogues forlorn in short and must destroy Allah a lock. Okay, so here Cordelia represents the anima, anima, A-N-I-M-A, -A. okay, what does the anima mean? Now, according to Carl Jung, the development of personality is related to, let's say, the persona, the shadow, and the anima. Okay? According to Carl Jung, the development of personality is related to three aspects. Persona, shadow, and the anima. Now, the persona is the social identity of man. The social identity of man. It is the identity that is accepted by society. Okay? So, in this case, the persona means that man behaves in a way 
that is approved of by the society. So this is the persona. Now the shadow is the dark side of the inner self of man. The shadow represents the evil side of the human character. Okay, so in this case, the shadow is represented by the evil characters that have persecuted King Lear. Okay, so the shadow, i.e. the dark side of the human character, is represented by Goneril, Regan, Edmund, and Cormel. And the anima is the sole image of man. The sole image, S-O-U-L. Image, I-M-A-G-E. I.e. it is something that man aspires for. Something that man highly appreciates. Okay? So in the case of King Lear, the play, the shadow is represented by the two evil daughters and the bastard son of Gloucester. The anima is represented by Cordelia. Okay? So Cordelia represents the moral values that King Lear aspires for. So that's why she is his anima. Okay? Cordelia is his anima. So Cordelia is the anima of the main of the main plot. Edgar is the anima or the animus because Edgar is a man. Anima is feminine. Animus is masculine. A N I M U S. Edgar is the animus of the sub. And the two plots converge at the end in Edgar. Edgar represents also the moral values that King Lear aspires for. Doctor, so anima is opposite to shadow and it's always good? It is the opposite, yes. It is always perfect. Something perfect that you aspire to have. Okay? So that's why we call it the soul image. Okay. okay. That's why we call it vital energy, the driving force of man's life. Okay. So we live, we work to achieve a certain goal. Okay. So this goal is the anima that we cherish. Okay. And according to Carl Jung, calls it the anima, i.e. he gives it a feminine quality because man is always attracted to the opposite sex. Man is attracted to a woman. Okay? So the anima is something that man is attracted for. Okay? So it is the vital energy of man's life. So it leads man to go on seeking to achieve a certain noble cause. Okay? So here, Cordelia of the main plot and Edgar of the subplot represent the noble Virtues that King Lear likes to have in his kingdom. Okay? So that's why Cordelia is a source of life for King Lear. Okay? So she says, Had you not been their father, i.e. if you had not been their father, these white flakes had, would have challenged pity 
of them. Okay, so she has a sense of pity, a sense of love. Was this a face to be opposed against the warring winds? To stand against the deep, dread, bolted thunder in the most terrible and nimble stroke of quick cross lightning? To watch the dew with this thin helm? Mine enemy's dog, though he had bit me, should have stood that night against my fire. So Cordelia is all forgiving. Okay? So even her enemy will be hosted by her during that storm. Okay, even her enemy will be hosted by her during that storm. So this highlights the human nature of Cordelia. Okay, I may, I skip two or three lines. Cordelia, how does my royal lord, how fares your majesty? It is by 45 in my edition. So in this case, I skip one, two, three lines. Cordelia, how does my royal lord, how fares your majesty? Lear, you do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scold like molten lead. Okay? Now to be bound upon a wheel of fire means that to be tormented in hell. So the wheel of fire is one of the torments of hell. So here King Lear imagines that Cordelia is a blessed soul in heaven whereas he is suffering in hell. Okay, Inglir imagines that Cordelia is a blessed soul in heaven, whereas he is a man punished in hell. So that's why he says, I am bound upon a wheel of fire. Okay, then at the end of this act, it is line 85. Lear, you must bear with me. Pray you now. Forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. So King Lear asks for Cordelia to forgive him. Okay. So at the end of the play, King Lear dies as a king man. Of course, Cordelia will forgive him. Okay. So the hero of the main plot and the hero of the subplot are forgiven at the end of the play. Therefore, they die 
as Christian figures. They don't die as sinners. Okay, the last act. Act 5 scene. Okay, so King Lear and Cordelia, uh, in other words, the French army lose the battle. Cordelia and King Lear are taken as hostages. They are sent to prison. Edmund orders a captain to kill Cordelia in prison. Donna poisons her sister Regan because she doesn't want Regan to get married to Edmund. She wants Edmund to be her husband. And in the letter that she sent to him, she says to him that, or she orders him to kill her husband Albany so that after the war they will get married and she will make him the king of the kingdom. But Edgar intercepts the letter, intercepts I-N-T-E-R-C-E-P-T-S, intercepts the letter, I.e. he takes the letter from Oswald, it is not delivered to Edmund. Now at the end of the play, the letter is used as a proof against Edmund, okay? So Edgar gives the letter to Albany before the battle takes place, and he tells him, or he asks him, to call for him at the end of the battle. So at the end of the battle, uh, Albany accuses Edmund of treachery, of treason, he is a traitor, so that's why he accuses him of treason, T-R-E-A-S-O-N. And he calls on Edgar to prove that Edmund is a traitor. Okay? So by anyway, uh, Regan is poisoned by her sister. She dies. Goneril at the end kills herself because her intention is made clear to all people. Edmund is killed in a duel with Edgar. Okay, so he engages in a duel with Edgar. He dies. At the end of the play, King Lear and Cordelia die. Albany wants to pass the throne on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Albany wants to pass the throne on to Edgar and to Kent, or to King Lear, before King Lear dies. He says that King Lear is the rightful king, so he wants to give up ruling the kingdom. King Lear dies. After King Lear dies, he asks, asks Edgar and Kent to rule. The kingdom, Kent says that he is an old man and he will not rule, so at the end, Edgar becomes the king. Okay? So we have done with King Lear. <clears throat> I read something. Okay, Act 5, Scene 3. Okay, Act 5, Scene 3, the British camp near Dover. Enter in conquest with drum and colors Edmund, Lear and Cordelia as prisoners, 
Captain Soldiers. Lear. Okay, Edmund Cordelia Lear. No, no, no. Come. Let's away to prison. We two alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. So we live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. We'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out, and take upon us the mystery of things. As if we were God's spies and we'll wear out in a walled prison, facts and sets of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Again, there is an emphasis on forgiveness. So King Lear says, when thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. Okay, I will read something from page 189 in my edition. It is Act 5, Scene 3. Act 5, Scene 3, line, let's say, 167. Line 167. Edgar, let us exchange charity. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou hast wronged me. My name is Edgar, and thy father's son. The gods are just, and of our pleasant vices, make instruments to plague us. The dark and vicious place where he, where thee he got cost him his eyes. Okay, so the gods are just and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. Again, there is, this is a reference to the justice of the gods. So the gods are just and they punish people for their sins. So that's why he says, the dark and vicious place where thee he got cost him his eyes. I.e. Gloucester has lost his eyes because he committed adultery. Yes, Edmund is the result of prostitution. So Gloucester the prostitute, the male prostitute, is punished by the gods. That's why he has lost his eyes. And this is related to the morality play. So the play I told you at the beginning can be viewed as a morality play. It deals with the conflict between good and evil. And at the end of the play, all the evil characters are destroyed. So here, Gloucester is an aspect of the morality play. Gloucester is punished for the sin of adultery. Okay? In addition, the two evil daughters, Edmund and Cornell, are punished. And the good is rewarded at the end. So the good is represented by Edgar. So I will leave the discussion off at this point. 
next time I will read the last, let's say, two pages of King Lear, and I will introduce Macbeth. So we will have a class on Wednesday at 10.30 as usual. Do you have any questions? No, everything is clear, Doctor. Thank you. Okay. So, see you. Okay, we will meet next week. Yes, okay, Doctor.